Good afternoon. I'm Katie Cottingham, and welcome to this news briefing from the 251st National Meeting and Exposition of the American Chemical Society in San Diego. We're joined today by Dr. Adam T. Woolley from Brigham Young University. He will be talking to us about his work on how DNA origami could help build faster, cheaper computer chips. Dr. Woolley? Thank you. So, our research involves using the self-assembly capabilities of DNA, just like it does in life, to form structures that could be used for computer circuits. And you know, currently the, the approach for making computer circuits involves, uh, if you want to set up a facility, you write a check for billions of dollars to, to build that equipment to be able to get down to things that are very, very small sizes, uh, a few tens of nanometers, uh, which is about one one thousandth the diameter of a human hair. And so we are using DNA, designing DNA to assemble into structures that are in that same size range to make uh, and assemble materials that are used in computer circuits uh, to be able to, to make these potentially in a much less expensive and a, a much simpler way. The, the work that uh, my student, uh, Kenneth Lee, presented on at this meeting involves making a 3D structure, and so it's a, 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 a essentially like a cylinder or a tube, and it has the ability to locate it at specific positions on a surface through DNA uh, interactions. And then the goal is for us to be able to fill up the inside of that uh, cylinder structure with materials that could be used um, in circuits such as, as semiconductors and the like. And so we're, we're excited about the, the prospects for, the, for this work. And uh, we think that it has uh, great potential to have an impact in, in areas of uh, making computer circuits um, in a novel way. OK, thanks. And so do we have questions? Please state your name and affiliation when you're asking the question. Kath. Hi, so it's Kath O'Driscoll from Chemistry and Industry magazine. Um, can you just say what the advantages of DNA are? Um, how much smaller can you go than conventional silicon chips with, with DNA? And what are the implications for manufacturing? How do you envisage manufacturing might change as a result? Sure. So uh, the two questions, one was about the advantages of DNA. And so, so one of the advantages is that uh, DNA, it, 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 with, with con making conventional circuits, you, you start off with a surface and then you carve away and add pieces to it. And so it's, it's, it's not very efficient in terms of the materials and then just the upfront costs of building the facilities. So with DNA, it's sort of a bottom-up assembly approach where the DNA organizes itself into the structure. So you, you mix the appropriate things together and it self-organizes. So that's an advantage. Um, in terms of how small you can go with DNA, so uh, double-stranded DNA has a diameter of about two and a half nanometers, and that's about a factor of, what is that, about a factor of six or so smaller than what they are commercially ramping up with, with uh, the fab line. So there's potential to go um, considerably smaller than what's um, currently available. Okay, other questions? Um, I have a question. So um, what role does DNA's genetic information content play in these structures? Like, are you going to get cell phones that come alive or something? Uh, should we be worried about that? <laughs> yeah, so, so actually the, the DNA is, is only there to guide the assembly process. And so it's, it's essentially, um, it's like scaffolding that once we've built the, the structure, the electronic materials in there, the DNA is, is not needed for anything. Um, one, one could use DNAs that um, have genetic meaning, you know, related to an organism, but, but you don't have to. Mm -hmm. um, they could be entirely synthetic, and, and you know, what, what we need is the ability for those base pairs to form A, T, and G, and C to, to fold into the desired structures. Okay. Any other? Oh, question in the back. Online question. I need to turn this on. Um, Christine Sa, Office of Public Affairs. Um, I just had a question about the stability of DNA for use in electric circuits, how, how stable would it be? That's a great question. So compared to, to many biological structures, DNA actually has 
quite a bit better stability. It's, you know, base pair DNA can hold together over a reasonable range of pHs and it's stable up to, you know, just below uh, 100 degrees or 90 or so degrees Celsius. So compared to other biological things, it's reason reasonably stable. We would need for the DNA to be stable over the conditions wherein we fill it up with other materials. And then again, since, since it's only the scaffolding, once we've built what we need, then the, the long-term stability isn't as important. So if, if it falls apart, that would be okay. Can you say a little bit more about what materials you're filling up the DNA with and, and why? Sure. So um, we're, we're still at fairly initial stages with the, the filling the, the inner part. So we've done some prior work where we've, uh, we've deposited several different metals. So we've done silver, gold, and uh, copper, and nickel. And there may be some others. We've done some work with carbon nanotubes as well. Um, for these 3D structures, we would envision filling them with some combination of metal and or semiconductors. And we've been interested in some materials like uh, tellurium, which is a precursor for making some calcogenides. And so that, that, that's one of them that we've done some initial work on sort of two-dimensional structures, but not the, the 3D structures like um, we were reporting in this meeting needs to happen really before these become competitive with, say, silicon chips? I mean, what's the big breakthrough that's needed and how far off is that? Oh, great question. I think one of the, one of the biggest challenges is controlled placement on a surface. So it, it's pretty easy to make these structures. Uh, the yields are, are reasonably good. But then placing them in controlled locations and, and you know, if you're making high density computer chips we need to be able to control where they localize down to uh, you know certainly tens of nanometers uh, resolution and that's that's something it's sort of a chicken and egg thing how can you place it on a surface without patterning it but and 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 so that's that's certainly a challenge um, I think scale up as well will be an issue I mean we, we we make a lot of these structures but there's still some question about you know are the yields good enough for the computer industry they want 99.999 sort of uh, defect free and you know for a for a typical synthesis if you've got 99% you're you're amazed and and so we there, there we may need to do some things to improve yields with the structures and it talks in the press release it talks about the small size of electronic components uh, mm -hmm. gadgets i mean would these be sort of a wearable electronics is that the type of thing that might be envisaged or i i think you know anywhere where there's currently you know electronics so cell phones computers you know all, all kinds of you know tablets all kinds of things like that and certainly wearable electronics if if they're small enough and and light enough then then yeah i mean we th this could potentially impact any of those fields can you say something about the types of plants that you envisage these might be built in, what they would look like compared with the traditional fabs? Uh, that's a great question. I, I mean, I think it would look more like a, so instead of the, the traditional fabs where you have um, a lot of high-end instrumentation that's sort of daisy-chained together in, a, in an assembly line fashion, this could be, at least some parts of it would be more like a chemistry or a biochemistry lab um, where you'd have... Uh, that, that sort of instrumentation. I think there would still need to be some equipment uh, of the assembly line variety to, to make sure things are packaged and such. Okay. Bela? Uh, Bela Buslik, Office of uh, Public Affairs. Um, let's go a little further. Uh, uh, there's been a lot of discussion, uh, particularly the science fiction, of machines taking over. Now that you're starting to build a machine uh, with essentially attributes of a living organism and so forth, what is it, it is that's going to prevent uh, artificial intelligence from, uh, from turning back on DNA and start to cr create uh, something everybody is afraid of? <laughs> Interesting. Um, so uh, there, there are things one, I mean, just like in the genetic engineering field, people uh, will uh, incorporate into that antibiotic resistance genes, or I guess antibiotic susceptibility genes, so that, you know, they can only grow in a certain, a certain environment. I mean, we could certainly do that with the, the materials that, to make the, that, that form the DNA. Mm -hmm. And that would be, uh, I mean, so, so some of those same concerns that are used in molecular biology, biochemistry, and, and ways that they avoid, you know, these 
organisms you know invading or, or you know getting out of the lab Th those are some of the things that, that could happen I mean at least with the, the the DNA origami technique we, we only use the purified DNA and so it doesn't have the rest of the the sort of machinery for these uh, for, for it to replicate but um, you know I guess if th there may be some some people out there that, that would be interested in in including the machinery uh, so basically uh, other than the self-assembly capability of this uh, DNA, uh, you could use any kind of, kind of a scaffolding as long as, as you could make it self-assemble, which there might be some, uh, something out there. That, that, that is certainly true. Um, and we, we've chosen DNA just because it's available and nature's done a really great job of figuring out how to get it to, to assemble with high yields. And so, you know, it's, it's, already, it's already available. You know, certainly one could try to synthesize something new. Um, and, you know, I think maybe as, as understanding of protein folding continues to improve, it might be possible to make these sorts of scaffolds with proteins, although I think the, the stability of folded proteins isn't isn't typically as good as DNA. Thank you. Okay, other questions? Uh, I have a question. Uh, how about RNA? Is that worse or better than DNA? How does that stack up in your origami? Yeah. So, so we, we haven't tried RNA, but in, as a general rule, RNA is a little more finicky. It, there are a lot of RNases just around in the environment, and, and so you have to work under more specialized conditions than with DNA. And so it, it might be possible to use RNAs for this, but we've chosen DNA just because we don't have to deal with the, these enzymes that degrade RNA. Okay. If there aren't any other questions, then thank you very much for attending the press. Oh, do we have another question? Okay. One more question. <laughs> question, sorry. Um, so are you starting with scratch with the DNA? Are you, are you taking base pairs and then, um, I don't know exactly how this would work. I don't have the scientific background, but um, are, you, are there certain segments of DNA from particular organisms that are well suited for what you're doing? Yeah, so, so we take the, the, there are really two pieces to, to folding these DNAs. One of them is a long, single-stranded piece of DNA, and we, and we liberally borrow from you know, microorganisms. So we use a, one called M13 as, is a common one. It's about 7,300 bases long. And so we use that for part of it. And then we design about 200 synthetic oligonucleotides. And, and those are custom synthesized. We make those. And then we use those to, to fold the two, fold it all into, into the structure. So some of it is, is naturally occurring. Some of it is, is synthesized. OK. Oh, another question. Yep. Sam Tracy, Chemistry Worlds. Uh, kind of related to that, does the sequence of the DNA affect its uh, stability or its ability to form these scaffolds? Uh, it's not something we've studied directly, but I, I would imagine it does. Um, you know, we, people have, in, in fact, we also have, have studied several different uh, sequences for our, our scaffold strand to fold the DNA origami. Uh, I don't know that it's yet been systematically studied how much that would affect it, but w one would expect, you know, there are certain combinations, uh, GC sections tend, tend to be more stable than AT sections in the DNA. And so uh, there's probably going to be some kind of a sequence dependence um, in these structure, in, the, in making these things. Okay, Bela has one last question. Uh, Bela Buslig, Office of Public Affairs again. Um, carrying on with, with Katie's question about RNA, well, of course, everybody knows about RNA, messenger RNA, and, and transfer RNAs carrying all kinds of things. Could you possibly use a, a construction technique as such, uh, you know, attach something to, to the transfer RNA and kind of build up ex exactly what you want. I mean, these, uh, uh, usually it's amino acids that, uh, that these are carrying, uh, which are perfect for, for holding metals and everything else under the sun. The sun. So you could actually uh, make a structure and, and essentially biologically design, uh, design a chip uh, after which you could just get rid of all, uh, all the organic matter, and there you are. Mm -hmm. 
It's an interesting possibility. Um, uh, methods for, so, so methods for DNA replication, I think, are a little bit more advanced than sort of uh, what would it be in vitro protein replication. I mean, the, the best way is, of, is you, you clone it into some system and then you grow it up that way. And so um, it's, it's not something we've, we're actively pursuing, but it, it, it's certainly, you know, something that could be done and, and you know the ability to to custom synthesize proteins like you can custom synthesize DNA in, in scale um, would be you know could potentially allow this this to work you know or in fact using the combination of of you know the cellular machinery that already um, is is kind of in place to, to synthesize proteins that would you know it, it certainly it would be an interesting topic to, to consider for for um, making interest, making novel structures. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, everyone. And the archived version of this session will soon be posted at bit.ly slash ACS Live San Diego. Please join us for our next press conference today at 2 on advances in lipstick forensics. Thank you. Thank you.